So we'll just create the Litecoin wallet using our cold card. And uh, there you go, there's Litecoin. We'll just sign and send the transaction just like normal. And there you go. Having a Bitcoin only hardware wallet probably doesn't actually mean what you think it means. And that's actually very useful in terms of being able to recover in situations where you might have done something like send a Litecoin to a Bitcoin address or perhaps sent Bitcoin to uh, some other altcoin address by accident. It might help you understand why there is inherent risk in storing a multiple cryptocurrencies on your hardware wallet, no matter which brand, as well as why claiming forks uh, and altcoins and all those kinds of things can actually be dangerous. The video is just gonna cover how to install Python and run Electrum from source. And in this case, I'll be using Electrum LTC because that's currently broken uh, for literally every Trezor model on the market in terms of sending Litecoin transactions. I'll then be looking at how you go about doing uh, this recovery using your hardware wallet and uh, Electrum, as well as some uh, tips for some issues you might run into along the way. And then I'll be spending some time looking at how you deal with the uh, different path isolation behavior for different hardware wallets. And if you haven't already done so, hit subscribe and that way you can stay in the loop for content I make to help you find your way in the crazy and often hostile environment that is cryptocurrency. It's gonna be a longer video just because I want to make sure everything was in one place for folk who are trying to do this recovery because I've had some folk with Trezors uh, who've sent Litecoin to a Bitcoin address specifically ask me for this content. Uh, so it'll all be in the video. And for those who are interested in only one part of it, uh, you know, just use the chapter markers in the description or they should be in the navigation bar across the bottom of your YouTube uh, playback window as well. All right, so we're just, first thing we're gonna look at is running Electrum from source, and this will work for pretty much all Electrum forks. And uh, again, this can be useful if uh, it's been a while since the official release for the version of Electrum you're trying to use and you wanna run it straight from the repository. I'll also just have these steps uh, in the description, just in text as well, in case you get lost. So the first thing you're gonna need is Python, and uh, we're just gonna download the default Python for Windows, and I've all uninstalled my Python for you, and uh, we are just gonna install that just using all of the defaults, but just make sure that you select this button here, which said add Python 3.9 to path. There we go. And if we open the Windows thing and just type in CMD, and that'll take us into command prompt and hit enter, we can see that we're now running Python. So uh, that is successfully installed and we're ready to move on. So we'll just exit that. We'll leave the command window open because we'll use that later. Next thing we'll do is just grab the source for Electrum LTC and uh, we'll just go straight to the GitHub for that. There it is. And we'll just assume you don't have GitHub installed, so we'll just download the whole thing in a zip folder. We'll just unzip the file we downloaded and I'll just use the Windows default tool because I'll assume that's what you've got. And we'll just stick with all the defaults. Okay, so now we have our Electrum folder and just because the way Windows does it, it's too deep in there, but that's fine. So there's all the files for Electrum. And as you can see there, it's just all in our downloads folder. So what we're gonna do is we can actually just navigate straight there by copying this path here, going back to a command prompt that we had open and just type CD space, and then I'll just uh, right click and that will paste that and it will just go there in one go. Otherwise you'll have to nav uh, manually navigate to the folder just using the standard uh, Windows command prompt commands. Okay, so the first thing we wanna do is just install all of the requirements that Python needs for Electrum. So we will just type in pip3, and then we wanna say install uh, r, and then that's requirements, and then we're gonna point it to this requirements file here that is just in the contrib folder of Electrum. Hit enter. All right, and they're all installed. And we also want to uh, install all the requirements for hardware wallets because we're going to be using them too. So basically it's the same command as before except the text file has a uh, hw at the end of it. There we go, they're all installed. Now what I will say is this requirements for the hardware wallets one is actually optional in that if you just have, if your system has major issues trying to get any of these to build and install uh, for any reason, you can actually just use the process which I'll show you at the end with the uh, stock version of Electrum and the version of Electrum LTC that we will run that doesn't actually have the libraries for hardware wallets. So uh, if that's you, uh, keep watching to the end and your process will be there. 
We also want to install PYQT5. Okay. One thing I will say is if you're trying to build uh, Electrum for some sort of exotic altcoin fork or something like that, uh, you might run into issues with some of the requirements uh, needing to be sort of built from source on your system and wanting other software that would allow them to do that. Uh, an easy workaround for that can actually be just to download a previous version of Python. So the default uh, for Python right now is 3.9. And uh, what you'll find is if you actually go back uh, one or two major releases, so say uh, try Python 3.9, 8 first or even uh, Python 3.7 uh, that you might actually have more success getting all of the requirements satisfied with uh, pre-built packages. Now one of the challenges with Electrum now is there are actually requirements that just aren't uh, pure Python and what that means is if you try and run it right now if you just type in Python run Electrum it'll actually complain that it is missing this li uh, library here. And the instructions say go and build it yourself uh, which you can absolutely do, but it's just a bit of a nuisance doing that on Windows and not at all noob friendly. So what I've actually gone and done is just made a repository and uh, there'll be a link for this one in the description that is essentially what I'm just calling the uh, lib SECP 256k1 lazy builds and it's just a, a GitHub repository that includes uh, the built files that are just built using exactly the commands out of uh, the Electrum repository. Uh, you know, please uh, only use these for like testing, recovery and development. Um, if you want something that has all the security of building fully from source, please just build them yourself. So anyway, basically on this repository, we have two separate folders. So we've got this one here that says x86, that is for 32-bit uh, installs of Python or Windows. Uh, and the other one we have is 64-bit. And both of them just have that DLL file in them that I just built yesterday. And I'll rebuild from time to time uh, if these don't you know, just work. But essentially what you need to do is download the uh, one that matches your environment. So your best bet, honestly, is just to try the 64-bit one because that's the default that Python will install now. And uh, if you have the wrong one, you'll just get an error that looks like this one. So just swap it for the other one. So anyway, if we go to download that DLL file and we'll just say download. And if we go into our downloads folder, we can see it's there. So we're just going to right click and say cut. We're going to go into the Electrum LTC master folder that we unzipped before and then we're going to go into the Electrum LTC folder um, and we're just going to paste that there. And uh, if you were just using Electrum, this would just say Electrum, not Electrum LTC. But anyway, that's where we want to put the file. And if you're unsure of where it should go, you can actually just look at this error message here, which tells you exactly where uh, Electrum is looking for it. But anyway, I've put the file there. So if I go to run it, and there you go. So we're running Electrum from source and look, it doesn't actually matter that synchronization could be slow because we're only really using this for recovery. So uh, I can just live with it. So for this video, I've just sent a dollar worth of Litecoin to the following Bitcoin SegWit addresses and you can see their addresses listed here and the derivation paths they are at are all listed here as well. All right, so we'll just start with the easiest recovery. That's where your wallet will just happily run uh, with Litecoin and sign transactions, no worries at all. And this applies for a cold card and for a keep key. So we'll just say file, new, and uh, we can actually close that now. I'm not gonna worry about giving them names. And we say we want a standard wallet. We say we have a hardware device. And uh, there we go, we can see the cold card just there. So we'll say next, and this is where the derivation path matters. And we're gonna change the derivation path from the Litecoin derivation path to the Bitcoin derivation path. And uh, that's basically just done by changing this two to a zero. And you can leave the rest the same. And then we can just say next. I'm not gonna worry about encrypting the wallet for the purpose of this video. And there we go. So we can actually see the Litecoin that I sent to the Bitcoin address, uh, which is there at the equivalent Litecoin address just on the cold card. So basically the process to send that back to my uh, Litecoin wallet is the same as if this was just a native Litecoin wallet. So we can just say send, stick the address in there and just say pay. And I can just say sign.
And the thing you'll notice here is that all the information, uh, even though we're gonna be sending on the Litecoin chain, is actually giving us the amount and saying Bitcoin. And the address here is actually the equivalent Bitcoin address. But if you stick that address in a uh, Litecoin pay to script hash converter, you will actually see that uh, it produces the Litecoin address that we're sending to. So we can see that and we can just say, okay. And there we go. So that is signed and we can just broadcast that and the payment is sent. And there you go. So we can see that has now sent the Litecoin back to our uh, correct Litecoin wallet. And this is also exactly the same process you would use if you had a keep key. No messing around, no error messages, warnings or anything like that, it just works. And uh, again, this process with the cold card will also work just fine uh, offline signing via PSBT. The next thing I'll show you is how to do this with a Legend Nano. This is the same for a Nano S or an X. And uh, basically the device won't appear there unless you have one of these apps open. But instead of opening the Litecoin app, we are gonna open the Bitcoin app. Because uh, otherwise the Litecoin app will throw you all sorts of uh, errors and warnings that the derivation path is wrong. So we will just go back and we'll scan for that again. There we go. There's our Ledger Nano. And we will just say next. Uh, we are going to use the same derivation path that we used on all the others because this is like the default Bitcoin one. This is the most common uh, thing, mistake you're going to have to have made. We won't worry about encrypting the wallet file. And uh, there we go. So there's the Litecoin that I'd accidentally sent to the Bitcoin address. Uh, again, sitting on the equivalent uh, Litecoin address that of the Bitcoin address. So we'll just say send, do the maximum amount, and I'll just split this up so you can see the signing as a separate step to broadcasting. We'll just say sign. And uh, again, like with the cold card, you'll see here, this is actually gonna give us our outputs with Bitcoin, even though the amounts are actually the same for Litecoin. So there's no conversion or anything magic happening here. Uh, the, bit, the device just thinks it's signing a Bitcoin transaction when it's actually signing a Litecoin one. So there's the addresses, and if you wanted to, you could uh, use an address converter just to verify that these are in fact the correct ones if you've sent a large amount. And then we would just say accept. And then we confirm the fees, accept and send. And there we go. And we'll broadcast that Litecoin transaction too. So uh, there we go. So the LTC have been sent back home. So happy days. So the process for this is the same as all the others. You should be starting to see the pattern here. Okay, so we'll select we have a hardware device. All right, we'll select the Trezor T. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we'll just change the derivation path to the standard Bitcoin SegWit one, say next. And we're not gonna worry about encrypting the wallet file. Okay. So here is our wallet. So uh, I've done a few transactions on this one already, and I'll just show you what happens. So if you try to send to a uh, Litecoin address on a Bitcoin derivation path, uh, we'll just go into advanced. If I click sign, uh, it'll actually throw a warning here. So firstly it says path is unknown. So are you sure? So that's because it's not the standard uh, derivation path that you would normally expect for Litecoin, and we'll say sure. And we'll say yes. And here we go, we're confirming the sending. See, you notice it's saying LTC because this wallet is actually aware that we're trying to uh, send Litecoin, not just Bitcoin. And we'll say yes. And we'll hold that to confirm. And it looks like it's gonna work, but then bonk. Uh, forbidden key path. Bummer. So what we'll do is we'll open command prompt again. And the Trezor libraries will actually have been installed when you installed all the requirements for Electrum. So if we just type in Trezor CTL, we can actually see that it will give you just all the different commands that they normally ask. So what we wanna do is Trezor CTL set. If we hit enter, that shows us all the options. So we wanna set safety checks and if you hit enter again, you can see the two options. So the options, uh, by default, it is strict. So that means it'll reject the transaction like we just saw. And we want to set out to prompt. So that means it'll warn you, but it'll still do it. 
Okay, so please confirm action. Here we go. So this will allow you to confirm actions which might be dangerous, allow unsafe prompts, and we will say yes. Okay, so now our Trezor will happily sign that same transaction. So if we go back into the uh, same window and click sign again, it'll give us all the same warnings as before. Yes, 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 yes. Hold and confirm. And this time it will happily sign the transaction. So we can then just say broadcast and all of our Litecoin has been recovered from the Bitcoin address and sent back to my Litecoin wallet. And we can now see that in the transaction history. Though before we finish with the Trezor, we'll also just put the safety checks back to strict. Just because it is worth having it on there uh, in terms of safety, uh, unless you're doing a recovery. So we'll just say yes. And there we go. So the device is back to behaving like it would by default. Okay, now the next thing I'll show you is just how to do this with a Trezor 1 because it is different to a Trezor T. So we'll just do the same process as before. Standard wallet. Okay, so the process uh, for the Trezor 1 is the same. So we're just going to set the derivation path. Though the difference on this one is that this is actually using the second Bitcoin SegWit account. So I'm doing two things. I'm changing the derivation path from a 2 to a 0 and I'm changing the last 0 to a 1 because it is the second Bitcoin account uh, on this device. And we'll just say next. Now, this wallet here is showing nothing, even though the derivation path is correct. And the reason for that is that the gap limit in the uh, wallet is such that all of these addresses that have been used in my Bitcoin wallet are not used on the Litecoin chain. And because they are larger than the gap limit of the wallet, uh, it's actually not detecting them. So we're going to have to do two things for this one. And again, this is important because depending on how much you have used your Bitcoin wallet, you may need to do this uh, if your Litecoin doesn't appear, but if the derivation path is certainly correct. So what we're going to do is we're going to say view we're going to show the console and we're going to get rid of that message. And what we're going to do here is actually just increase the gap limit in Electrum. That is basically how many addresses into the future uh, Electrum looks to work out the balance of your wallet. And if you want to know more about how that works, I've done a video on hierarchical deterministic wallets that will uh, clear that up for you. But for the purpose of this video, what we're going to do is we're just going to go into the console and we're just going to type in wallet dot change gap limit. And look, I'll just set it to 100. 100 is probably enough depending on uh, how much transactions you've been doing. So we'll just hit enter and now the gap limit is big. And look, it has instantly found uh, that next transaction because if we have a look in the addresses tab, it was actually only just beyond the uh, gap limit of 20. So uh, it's found it there, which is fantastic. And we can see that that was uh, there we go. We can see that that was address number 23. So it was just outside of the gap limit. But anyway, so we found our Litecoin. But if we go to send this back to my uh, wallet, and hit pay, we'll just go back into advanced. Now, if I hit sign, it does the standard Trezor thing. It looks like it's going to work. So it gives us uh, the message on the screen here, we can confirm the amount, outputs and all that sort of jazz and then bonk. It will just give you this error message here, failed to compile output, which is uh, entirely unhelpful. Um, but yeah, basically the uh, path isolation on a Trezor uh, needs to be handled differently. So this process I will show you will actually work for any um, wallet and I'm actually going to jump over to a Bitbox O2 and show it to you because a Bitbox O2 won't even let you get this far as it'll just throw an error when you try to create a Litecoin wallet on the Bitcoin derivation path. So we'll actually uh, keep Electrum LTC open because we are going to use that. All right, so what we're going to do is we're just going to go into Electrum and we're going to create a new wallet. Okay, so we've got the Bitbox O2 just here. All right, so let's do it. So we'll just say it's a standard wallet, hardware device. Okay, so we're going to select the Bitbox O2. This is in uh, Electrum, not Electrum LTC. Okay, so we'll just unlock the device. There we go. 
Okay, so we are just going to use the derivation path and because this is a Bitcoin Electrum, we don't actually need to uh, change the derivation path at all. We'll just stick with it as the default. Okay, so we have here on the left our Bitcoin wallet and uh, this is the uh, address and this address right here is the address that we sent the Litecoin to. Now what we can do here and now this is where it gets a bit funny. So what we can do is we can say wallet information and this is the Bitcoin wallet and then over here on the right with Electrum LTC we can say we want a new wallet and then we say we want a standard wallet and we say we have a master key. So what we're going to do is just copy this one from here from Bitcoin wallet and just shove it straight into this Electrum LTC on the right. Uh, I'm not going to worry about a password and bang. So what we have now here on the right is an Electrum watch only wallet that is essentially showing us the Litecoin representation of these same addresses here. And we can see that this one here that I sent the Litecoin to actually has the Litecoin over here on the chain. Now what will we do in this step then is we just copy, we'll just generate our transaction to send the Litecoin over here in Electrum LTC and we'll just go into advanced. So we've got our Litecoin wallet here on the right. We'll just finalize that. And this is a watch only wallet so we can't sign it. So we're just going to export, copy to clipboard. If we go over here to the Bitcoin Electrum wallet, just go uh, tools, load transaction, from text, just paste it right in. That's our transaction, bang. So what we've got now is the equivalent Bitcoin transaction and you'll see the amounts are all the same. It's just the uh, name of the currency which is different is all the same. And we can just say sign here on the Bitcoin wallet and we'll actually get, uh, just like on the cold card, the equivalent Bitcoin transaction to uh, that address, which again we could use a Litecoin address converter to confirm if it was a large amount. We can just ignore the uh, BTC because that's actually not what we're doing. And we'll just say all of these things are good. Transaction confirmed. All right, so on the left now we have a signed Litecoin transaction. And if we were to hit broadcast, uh, it would actually immediately fail because this would broadcast on the Bitcoin transaction and it won't be valid there. So again, we're just going to export the transaction, copy to clipboard. We'll go back into Electrum LTC on our watch only wallet, uh, load the transaction from text, and there it is. So this is now the signed uh, Litecoin transaction that we signed using our Bitcoin wallet. We can just say broadcast, and there you go, sent. So happy days. And the thing to know is this process here with the Bitbox O2 is exactly what you would do for a Kobo Vault or a cold card that you had fully air gapped in that you would be using the XPUB from the Bitcoin wallet to create a watch only Litecoin wallet which then generates the transaction, is signed by the Bitcoin wallet but then broadcast on the Litecoin network. And this is basically the same process that we have to use for the uh, Trezor One. Though the difference with the Trezor One is that we didn't actually have to create the watch only wallet. It actually just let us create uh, the wallet using the Electrum LTC. And so we just do the same process on the Trezor One that we did with the Bitbox. So we just say we have a hardware device. The thing to remember is that in this example, the Trezor actually, the Trezor One actually had it as the second Bitcoin account, not the first. So we just need to change uh, that to be the second account. We can just say next. Okay, we're not going to worry about encrypting the wallet file. All right. So now, again, just like before, this is the uh, Bitcoin uh, wallet and all the transactions. And then if we go into the addresses tab, we can actually see uh, the address that we sent it to before, which is this one here, which uh, again, corresponds to this one here. So basically what we want to do is we're going to generate our transaction over here on the right in Electrum LTC. So we're just going to say send, send the funds Oh, there we go. So there's the transaction we tried to send before. So we'll just uh, open it up and say pay. We'll just click advanced because we couldn't sign it before. So rather than try and say sign over here in Electrum LTC, we're just going to export it via the clipboard, load the transaction here. And there we go. 
So this is the uh, Bitcoin transaction on the right, again, just like with the, the uh, Bitbox O2. So we'll just say sign, and we'll confirm the details on the screen. You'll notice again, it thinks this is a Bitcoin transaction, so all the details match what it would for a Bitcoin transaction. And there it is, but we're not gonna broadcast it over here because it won't be valid. So copy to clipboard. We'll close that. Tools, load transaction from text. There it is. Okay, so here is our signed Litecoin transaction. We'll just say broadcast. And there you go. I've recovered all of the funds from these Litecoin addresses that I sent to all of these Bitcoin addresses without having to touch uh, seed phrases or anything else like that. All right, so it's probably just worth explaining a little bit about what just happened there. And the reason why this is possible is that uh, coins like Litecoin uh, and a lot of Bitcoin forks and altcoins actually use exactly the same signature format, uh, regardless of the fact that they're on different blockchains and your hardware wallet actually doesn't really have knowledge uh, of what it is signing. Uh, it's essentially just given a derivation path and some other information. And uh, if your wallet just tells it, hey, this is a Bitcoin transaction, even though it isn't, your wallet will just assume that that is the case and sign it. Where it can be an issue is that if you had malware in your wallet that was pretending uh, to be an altcoin or trying to uh, use your wallet in some really non-standard way, it might trick you into thinking that it is signing a harmless transaction on one blockchain when it is actually signing a valid transaction that can be valid on a different blockchain. And this will always be the case if you have a hardware wallet that has uh, multiple different cryptos that are stored on it that all use the same signature format. This is unavoidable. The only real way to totally segregate your funds in a situation like that is actually to use something like a, a different uh, BIP39 passphrase or something like that. So you're actually uh, cryptographically segregating your funds rather than having it happen essentially in the software interface and in the firmware. For someone to rob you in a situation like this, they would have to be supplying you with the uh, software wallet that you're using as well as the address to send the funds to as well as convince you uh, to sort of use your wallet in this non-standard kind of way. Uh, though it's really important to say that that is exactly what happens when you are doing something like claiming altcoins when there has been a fork. One of the things I see on Reddit from time to time is people who are in a big hurry to you know, claim every single random fork of their Bitcoin. And sometimes they are completely unaware of the potential issues that can create. When you go to split those coins, they are going to be on a derivation path that is valid on two different networks and often using a signature format which is valid on both networks. What this means is that someone could create a malicious wallet or split tool that says that it's claiming your coins and sending them and splitting them from one chain when it's actually doing it on the other. Now, I just wanna stop for a second and just make a few things really clear. This video is not meant to scare you or somehow uh, be seen as a criticism of hardware wallets or something that suggests that they are not secure because literally every single software wallet can do all of this all the time and you would never even know it had happened until it is too late. I also want to be really clear that I am not suggesting that you run out and add a separate BIP39 passphrase for every single crypto you hold. Because uh, again, this is one of those behaviors where you might actually end up increasing the chance that you would make a mistake in terms of managing all these different passphrases and end up losing your crypto by accident. It's important to emphasize that through normal operation of your hardware wallet, uh, especially if you're sticking with uh, either vendor supplied or mainstream software, this isn't a major risk. The uh, derivation path based warnings, which are what all of the different wallets use, they're actually pretty good. They're a good solution. The biggest takeaway from this video, if you're not primarily interested in recovery, is you need to make sure you don't just assume a hardware wallet means you can be careless and just not pay attention to what is on the screen. You always need to pay close attention to details like the crypto that is being sent on your hardware wallet. Don't ignore the warnings and be extremely careful if you are using your hardware wallet with some sort of altcoin or altcoin wallet that requires you to, for example, in the ledger situation, use the Bitcoin app to interact with this altcoin and the chain and where you're told, just ignore these warnings. They are a normal part of operation. You need to be extremely, extremely careful in those situations because you are essentially bypassing all of the features that are meant to protect you.
So there you go. This process is not only extremely useful for recovery, especially if you've accidentally sent uh, some altcoin to an address generated by your Bitcoin only wallet, uh, but it's also useful to understand a little bit about what this sort of path isolation drama was all about, as well as uh, some of the risks and some of the limitations as well around those risks and that it isn't something where someone can just easily uh, steal all of your funds and send them to themselves. I also hope this helps you understand the way that, uh, you know, if there is a hard fork on a network that your hardware wallet supports, your hardware wallet vendor often doesn't actually have to do anything. The support is already there from a hardware level in case, you know, some uh, significant changes are happening. Uh, but generally speaking, the changes will happen with these hard forks with the uh, software interface, that is the wallet software you are running. And the question of vendor support then just comes down to, you know, which software backends are they prepared to support? So there you go. If you manage to recover a large amount of crypto using this process, uh, you know, definitely consider sending me a tip to help me out. There's addresses to do that in the description. And uh, if you run into any trouble or have any questions, just leave a reply and I'll uh, do my best to help you out. Thanks for watching. I hope that was helpful. Hit like if you think that other people would find this video useful and hit subscribe if you'd like to be kept in the loop about future content I make that helps people stay safe in the crypto space and to recover if they get into trouble. If you have any questions about this video or a topic that you'd like me to cover, just leave a reply.